Right. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I hear an echo that's not good. to work. Um, so I'm, my name is Stefan Kanzer. Uh, I have the pleasure of teaching the second class or the second part of this course. Um, I, I just started here at Penn State here in, in, in January, so I'm all new. Uh, I've been in, in Munich before, the University of Munich. Um, this is also where I'm originally from. And in our research and I'm in my lab, we do computational biology, meaning we develop uh, a algorithms that we use to analyze uh, lots of sequencing data. Um, and the types of algorithms that we're using are exactly the ones that we're teaching here also. So we're, especially in this part of the class, we're discussing certain paradigms and design strategies of how to develop efficient algorithms. And this is exactly the kinds of algorithms that you also routinely see in, in, in our field of uh, computational biology. And today I'll talk about uh, the max flow problem. Um, the max flow problem was introduced long time ago in 1940, uh, sorry, 1954 by Harris and Ross um, for the Soviet railway traffic uh, uh, flow. So this is what they wanted to study. And uh, as you will see, this, this common framework of a, of a, of a flow problem um, can solve many other kinds of problems. That's why we're discussing them today. It was restricted to Soviet railway traffic fail, uh, flow, then I guess you wouldn't, you wouldn't talk about it today. But I think a sort of a, a more intuitive way of thinking about it um, is through um, pipes and water. If you want to pipe, uh, pipe through some water, I'm just trying to mute this thing here because I still hear myself. Doesn't me. Oh, no, it works. So the way to think about this is that you have sort of a, a, a source of liquid of water that you want to pipe through some uh, or push some through some pipes and you have thick pipes and thin pipes. And the question is, how much water can you pipe through this, uh, through this, through the system of, uh, of pipes. So let me show you this with an example. max flow problem that we're discussing today. You can read about it in the Corman book in paragraph 26. So to think about this problem, think about uh, pipes and water. Okay. Um, and in this particular example, in this toy example, you see we have this thin pipe, at least that's what I'm trying to, to draw here. Thick pipe. Together merge into sort of a medium sized pipe. A little bit tricky here. Not easy. You have this little tap on top. Okay, and so what you can visually already see is that this pipe is smaller in the sense that it can carry one gallon per minute, and the bigger one can carry 10 gallon per minute. And they together meet at a pipe that carries. Uh, up to 10, uh, 7 gallons per minute.
So you're given this, you know, these pipes, and you're wondering how much water can you pump through these pipes such that it doesn't sort of start over over spilling. Um, again, this is a very specific formulation of this problem, and you can imagine this, or maybe you can't at the moment. Imagine that this actually has lots of applications in, in different fields, uh, because instead of thinking of pipes and and the water tap or or faucet, think of um, uh, uh, a facility, a facility, a factory where you're producing some goods, and you're trying to ship these goods to a warehouse. And you can do this using different means of transportation. You can use trains. You can use cars. You can use big highways. You can use small side roads. And along each kind of uh, transportation, you can transport more or less of these goods. And so you want to come up with a scheme such that all the products that you're producing in your factory can be transported to your warehouse across all these different uh, um, lines of transportation. We actually have used a similar uh, idea in, in even in computational biology where you try to stitch together very short sequencing reads into full-length RNA sequences, which sounds completely not like a flow problem. But uh, this is such a flexible framework that it, it captures even such kinds of uh, uh, problems um, where you're yeah, trying to stitch together short sequences to longer sequences. And so the, the common framework of all of this, so all these examples, what they have in common is sort of a, a graph structure. Um, so if you model basically what you're seeing here as a, as a, as a, a tap and, and, and pipes, you can think of this as a graph where you have uh, basically nodes instead of these uh, joints between different pipes and these edges can represent pipes, they can represent uh, streets, highways, um, connections between computers of different bandwidth. Um, and you have a dedicated node, namely the one that I indicate was an S, the source node, which uh, stands for the, the source, the, the, you know, the, the factory, the, the water tap, anything that produces something that you want to ship through this network. And then you have a dedicated uh, vertex T that sort of absorbs what you're producing. So this could be, uh, I mean, here in this particular case, it's the outlet uh, of this network, this water pipes, but it could also be um, the, um, yeah, the warehouse or, or a parking lot in a, in a highway system. I guess highway systems don't have parking lots, but if you have any kind of streets and, and traffic flows into an intersection, it comes out of an intersection. And, and if, you know, some cars uh, end up in a parking lot, this would be sort of gone from your network. And this is where you absorb this, this uh, traffic in your network. So these are the main ingredients. We have nodes, we have edges, uh, we have capacities uh, on these edges. For example, we could say that, um, sorry, this edge here has a capacity of one. And this edge has a capacity of 10 and it continues down here. And here, and we said that this one has this one has capacity seven. So this is basically our graph abstraction of uh, the example shown here on the left, where we have these uh, thin uh, and sort of this uh, thick pipes that carry water that meet in this intermediate medium-sized pipe. Okay, so this is our our. Sort of abstraction of this of this of this problem. Um, so let's try to um, formalize this a bit more carefully as a so-called flow network. Let's define a so-called is that to figure out um, a flow network. Which will consist of exactly the things that we have just mentioned. We have A, a directed graph. G with uh, nodes and edges. We make two simplifying assumptions. Namely, that we don't have any anti parallel edges, meaning that if we have an edge UV in E, then that means that we won't have the reverse edge in our graph. So then 
B that you will not be in E. And B, we assume that we don't have any self loops. Okay, so this is the first ingredient. I mean, this is pretty clear from, from the example above. This is our directed graph. In fact, I forgot here my, my errors. So this is the directed graph, nodes and edges. Um, and we said before that these edges can carry more or less of your, of your traffic or of your liquid or whatever it is that you're trying to transport. And this, this is what we're modeling uh, using a capacity function. So besides a directed graph, we also have a non-negative uh, capacity function. We'll see that assigns every edge a non-negative value, meaning that really for all u, v, and e, we have that the capacity of u, v, this is the notation we're going to use, is greater or equal than zero. And if u, v, is not an edge in our network. This implies that the capacity of this edge uh, is zero. So another ingredient, which one is missing? Any suggestion based on our previous example? So I have a direct, I have a network, I have capacities. Uh, what else do I need to get sort of a meaning model, meaningful model of our transportation uh, flow problem? Yeah, then back to blue. The what? The shortest path. Uh, no, we have not said anything about the length of any path in our network. So far, we didn't care about that. Yeah. Beginning and destination, exactly. Uh, so in this particular case, we call them uh, source and, and sync, but it's exactly uh, right. So we have... So we need two distinguished uh, vertices. Namely, a so-called source, or as you call it at the beginning. And uh, a so-called sink that they typically denote by T in this context. <clears throat> and on top of that, the sort of meaningful networks, we also assume that every vertex will lie on a path from S to T. So we can reach any vertex from the source and you can sort of continue transporting flow from that vertex to the, to the sink, which makes sense by the, by the way we motivated this problem. So every... A vertex is on, on some path from source to sink. By the way, how's my uh, handwriting in the morning? Yeah, good, good, glad to hear. In the morning, I got some complaints about my. And writing, so I put a, lot, put a lot of effort here in making this, this readable. So here's two examples of a, of a good and a bad uh, flow network. So here's, uh, let's say, our start or sync, and we have the following structure in this network. This vertex and this one. So based on our definitions, I mean, I have to assign some capacities that in this class I will always denote in black color. So whenever I have sort of black colored uh, uh, weights or numbers on, on our edges, these denote capacities. Um, 
over one, two, these are just some capacities. <clears throat> and you can always see that this is uh, sort of a, a flow network that has all the ingredients that we defined above. It's a, it's a directed graph. Um, we have non-negative capacities assigned to each, each uh, edge. We have, oh uh, yeah, not yet. Now uh, we do have two distinguished vertices, the source and the, the sink in our graph. So this is uh, from where to where we want to transport goods in our network. And we also have that every vertex here, this one, uh, for example, through here can be or lies on some path from S to T, this one from here to here. This one can be lie on this path and, and then this path, for example, for this path, for this vertex. Okay, so this is a, a good network, now uh, sort of a, a bad network that actually isn't a network. We can call it a network. Uh, this could look like this, for example. Here we have source. Again, we have uh, our sink, and this is, looks very similar, except that I think one edge is missing. Um, I can assign the same capacities to my edges. We didn't assign one here. So it is now 16. Um, is this a, a good or bad um, network? And this is the flow network that will be defined, yeah. There's two, no, there's no, I mean, there's only one sync node the way I defined it. There's only, uh, I think, yeah, I see what you're saying. Exactly, and this would be, oh, sorry. And that would be this one. This is a vertex that doesn't lie on any S to T path. And this, why, and this is why this is not sort of a, a, a flow network that the way, the way we find it. And this one uh, is, is indeed one. Okay, so this is basically the, the structure that we're working with. Uh, and now the interesting thing, of course, is to assign a flow to these edges. So to decide how much of water you wanna you know, pump through these uh, individual pipes. And this is what we model with a so-called uh, flow. So a... O is simply a function F, we denote this by F, um, on the pairs of vertices. So we assign some real value here, such that uh, two constraints are satisfied. <clears throat> Given our flow network, we want to assign values to these edges, um, such that we satisfy two constraints based on our original motivation. These are very natural constraints. The first one is that we would never want to exceed the capacity of any edge. So we can only you know, pump as much water as we uh, are able to in, in, uh, based on the size of a pipe. And this is what we call the uh, capacity constraints. So this is what we call the capacity constraints. This simply says that uh, for all pairs of vertices, UV, F must be non-negative. We assign some non-negative uh, flow to each edge, but we have to uh, sort of satisfy the capacity of this, the corresponding edge in the sense that F always needs to be uh, smaller or equal than, than C, the capacity of that particular edge. So it makes completely sense, intuitively speaking. We can't pump more through a pipe than, than the size of this pipe allows us. And the second also is pretty much uh, uh, intuitively clear. If you think again of this example of, 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 of pipes and water, uh, the second constraint essentially says whenever you have sort of a connection of different pipes, and whatever comes into this connection has to also come out of this connection. There's no, no leakage in, in, our, in our pipes. Okay, this is what we call the uh, 
uh, flow conservation constraints. Which simply says that for all U and V, other than source and sink, so source and sink take uh, special roles here, uh, which again makes makes sense. In the source, we're producing something, so uh, and in the in the sink, we're absorbing something. So clearly, there we don't have floor con con uh, conservation. But for all other vertices, we want the following to hold, namely, if I summer over all vertices that are uh, entering a given vertex. So I sum up F uh, VU for our given vertex U. Then this has to be equal to the sum of all the flow of edges that are leaving a given vertex U. So this is equal to sum over all vertices V uh, with F of uh, UV. Okay, so, so I mean, this, what this equation says, just to repeat myself, here on the left, we're summing up the flow of all incoming edges into a given vertex U. And here we're summing up the flow of all outgoing edges of a given vertex U. And we want to have these two, be, these two sums to be, uh, to be equal. And this is what we call flow conservation. So that's, that's what, what we call a flow. This is a flow. All, whenever I say flow, I basically mean you know, assigning values that satisfy these two constraints. And then, of course, we're, we're interested in, in, in good flows, and good uh, will be measured in, in, in terms of its value the following way. So we define any, any guess what, what the value of a flow could be? What's a good flow, a bad flow? Yeah. So the capacities are always the same. So we the, this is fixed. This is basically our input. We have a graph with capacities. The only thing that we can control is the flow, the F. We can, so in principle, we don't have to assign anything, right? We could just take the zero flow, which satisfies these constraints. It satisfies all capacity constraints, and it also flows, and it also preserves the flow in each vertex. So it is a feasible flow, but it's not really a good flow, let's say because it really doesn't you know, move anything. So intuitively, we want to move as much as possible, which we can measure based on the outcome of our source vertex. So the source and the, and the sink, these will be the two vertices that don't have flow conservation, but in, the con in contrast, S produces something and we want to produce as much as we can, meaning we want to transport as much as we can through this, through this flow network. And this is basically what the, the flow means uh, or the value of the flow. So the Value of the flow. Value. Um, flow F is simply so we the notation we're using is this one here. So this this is not this is, doesn't indicate any cardinality or any absolute value. Here, this stands for, for the value of a flow F. And this value is just given by what's coming out of the source minus what's coming into the source. So what's the net production in our, in our network, in our flow network? This is what I'm writing down here. So if I sum over all vertices again, that's our um, exiting our source vertex. So I take F of SV for all vertices V, and I subtract the flow into S. So again, over all V uh, of F V S. Then this is the value of the flow. Okay, so this is the flow. Again, if, if you look at this carefully, this is simply the sum of the flow that leaves S, our source. And this is the sum of the flow that's coming back to our source. And this is this difference we want to maximize. We want to have the maximum net, net production uh, in our flow network. And this is exactly what the so-called max flow problem uh, is all about. Okay, so the max 
low problem. Following, you're given a network, a flow network. You want to find a flow. And when I say given a flow network, this includes capacity. So we have a graph, capacities, and source and sync. And we want to find a flow F. We simply maximize this value of the flow. So it's maximal value but using the same notation again. Is the problem statement clear to everyone what a maximum flow, what the maximum flow problem is about? So let's look at a simple example. Here's our source. We have the following edges and nodes. So this is again our initial example. <clears throat> and let's say we have the following capacities assigned to these edges, one here, 10 here, 10 here, and seven here. Then uh, any suggestion what a maximal flow could be in this, in this flow network? You're in the right number from somewhere. Seven, yeah. And how would you, I didn't see you saying it, but uh, how would you assign the flow in this network? So you just say, uh, I think if I understood this correctly, seven here, seven here, and seven here, right? Yeah. So I will always indicate the flow in these networks in blue. Um, capacity is in black, just a reminder. Um, and you can see this is correct. So, I mean, it's a, a feasible flow because we never exceed any capacity. And you can also see that we preserve uh, or we conserve flow in every vertex, um, except for source and, uh, and, and sync. Here, seven comes in, seven comes out. And here also seven comes in and seven comes out. Um, and why can't we increase it? Is, it? is it easy to see why we cannot have a better flow than this? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, exactly. So this seven here is, is, is sort of uh, constricting this and we can't really exceed this. But is it the only maximum path that you see here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is an alternative path, uh, maximum flow where we would uh, have a flow of six here and six here. We would have one here, one here, and then seven here again. So this is again, a flow of the same value of the same maximal value. So the maximum value is obviously uniquely defined, but as you can see, the maximum flow itself is not necessarily um, uniquely defined. Okay, so in this example, it was very easy to find such a maximal path. In general, it might not always be that easy. Um, but luckily, we have a very, very uh, uh, nice algorithm that was proposed just one year after Harris and Ross formulated this uh, Soviet railway traffic flow problem. Oh, there's a question or a... In this case, yeah, because we don't we have to uh, we have a we have a direction from S to T. Yeah. Um, and so for for the for the. In, in, in just 1955, just one year after this problem was posed uh, or formulated by Ross and, and Harris, this very famous uh, method was proposed by uh, Ford and Falkerson, which is very simple, but it works really, really well. And it's the basis of very different implementations of the same algorithm. So this is why this, this is often called a method and not really an algorithm, because there's many different implementations that have very different running times. And the, the general idea is very simple. 
Um, so you start with a zero flow. So you don't have you just you don't assign anything, and then every iteration you just increase the flow. And I'll show you uh, in a minute how this is being increased. So you don't hear my iPad because I hear myself a little bit, but I have no idea how to turn it off, and I, I'll figure it out until next time to not lose too much time. Um, so the Ford Falkerson method or algorithm um, works as follows. You start I just call this FFA uh, in short for Ford focus on algorithm. And again, the input to the to this algorithm is a directed graph. We have um, capac the capacities assigned to all edges, and we have two dedicated vertices S uh, and T. And then we initialize F simply to the zero, to the zero flow. So everything will be zero. And this works because this is a feasible flow. So we start from a feasible flow. Um, again, if we set everything to zero, we satisfy automatically all capacity constraints that are non-negative. Um, and well, everything that comes in has to come out. And it's true, of course, for zeros too. If nothing comes in, uh, nothing comes out. And so now in every iteration, we're trying to increase this uh, flow by a certain amount. Let me do this in the following way. Uh, we're trying, so starting from the zero flow, we take our network and then we simply try to find a path from source to sync in this network that has spare capacity. So I'm, I'm being vague here, I'm, I'm defining this more formally later, but spare capacity simply meaning that there's something left to, to push additional flow through. So if your capacity is 20 and you have pushed 10 through this to this uh, pipe, then 10. Uh, 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 units of capacity are, are left in, in this particular case. So you're, in each iteration, you're trying to find a path from the source to the sink uh, with spare uh, capacity, and this is the and this is the whole trick. You do this until you cannot find any such path anymore. So while there exists a path from source to sink. Uh, with, and I will be a bit vague here at this point, with uh, spare capacity. You simply use up that capacity, meaning that you add this particular leftover capacity to your flow. And I'll, I'll show you an example of what that means. So you use that capacity. And you will see that you need to do this carefully to make sure that whatever you get afterwards, after adding this spare capacity to your flow, that you will still have something feasible, or still a feasible flow. And once you cannot find such a path anymore, you return uh, your flow F that you have constructed in this iterative uh, scheme. Okay. It's a very simple idea. You start from nothing and then iteratively just find a path along which you just put more uh, uh, or yeah, push more flow along these pipes. So let's, let's see an example why this almost works. So again, here I'm showing a network uh, with, I think it's the same as we showed before. No. Okay. So here's our source vertex. 
and has uh, this can go here or here the vertex u to vertex v you also can go from u to v and you have your target sorry your, your sync vertex that you can reach from these two vertices These are nodes and edges and now capacities on our edges. That's what's missing to define a flow network. The capacity 20 here, we have 30 here, 20 here, here 10 and 10. So this is basically how we start. This is our input network. We have nodes, ST and, and capacities. And now we're finding a path from S to T with spare capacity. And since we started from zero, everything is sort of uh, leftover capacity. And we could walk, for example, along this edge with spare capacity 20, and then proceeding here with spare capacity 30, and then here with spare capacity 20. So this is one such path that we have described in this, in this while loop, okay? Then my question to you is how much flow can you actually now push through this path that I'm, that I'm marking here? suggestions so we have a path we know how, how much spare capacities are yeah how much 20 and why 20 exactly so you, you put 20 here and then 20 here you could put more here but you can simply uh, because the the previous one and the, the after one sort of restricts you to this um, that's that's correct, and this gives you a flow because a you're satisfying set capacity constraints, and since you're doing this along a path, every time you put something into a vertex, you also move it out when when you leave this vertex in this path. So you also have flow conservation, and this was why this is a, a feasible flow. Okay, this is this is good. Um, is there another path now after doing this? What I called before as a spare capacity, spare capacities now are here nothing, right? We have completely used up this uh, this edge. There's a spare capacity of 10 here and there's nothing left here, okay? So any, any suggestions how we could now, after sending this initial flow, proceed? Is there another path that we could use on this network? Using up spare capacity. Like this, V to U, but there's no edge. So this is, I mean, there's an edge, but in the opposite direction. So in this case, we can't. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, you're doing something more sophisticated here. It's not allowed, so this is a, uh, I mean, this works, and this is exactly what I want to get at, but based on my description so far, you can't do that because you would have to, I think if I understood correctly, you want to divert some previous flow and modify it and move some of this 20 here over there. Yep, yeah. So this, this is true. So I think you see that there is a, is a larger flow than, than our 20. There's namely a flow where you could have a total value of 30 by adding another 10 here and re-diverting other flow. Um, but the problem is, based on the description that we have so far, you can't do that, right? You, there's no path in this network uh, that goes from S to T that has sort of spare capacity. What you, just, what you described, uh, I believe, is the following. Uh, you could try to send additional 10 units of flow here. Um, then you're in trouble because you sort of get more, 10 more units of flow into V than you get out. So you could try to go backwards here and try to reduce this 20 to 10. So you're sort of uh, taking 10 units of this 20 units of flow and try to divert it into this edge. Because once you're ending up here, now you're sort of violating flow conservation in this one because you're uh, only 10 are leaving and 20 are, 20 are entering. So now sort of the leftover uh, 10 units, you would sort of divert to this edge to, to get a better flow of total value uh, 30. And that's exactly the idea. So 
just with sort of the simple network or the original network, we can't really do this strategy that I just described here on, on top, finding this as path, even though a better flow exists. So we have to be a bit more careful how we find such path or what such a path exactly means in, in what kind of network to make sure we don't get stuck in sort of local uh, optimal uh, solutions. Or let's say opt suboptimal solutions. And so the one structure that helps us to do that are so-called residual uh, networks. And intuitively, what we have to keep track of to do to apply basically this trick that you just suggested is that we have to, as before, keep track of what's left, right? We need to know what capacity is left and unused in our in each edge. But we also have to keep track of how much flow we sent already, like in this case, 20, because that's the kind of flow that we have to, or we could possibly undo as we did by walking backwards, uh, basically on this edge. And since like this, you know, walking backwards and undo is also a bit, you know, it's a bit dirty and, and, and it's a bit nasty to do, we want to do this more directly and sort of create another network in which we more naturally can, can apply exactly this, this idea that we have just described. Okay, so intuition first is uh, that you need to keep track um, of how much capacity is left, the residual capacity. These are the two, the, the two takeaways really from, from this example. To keep, we need to keep track of how much capacity is left. This is what's called the uh, residual capacity. But we also need to know how much we have already moved along uh, such pipes. We'll upload these, uh, these notes also after, after class, uh, so you don't need to make notes. As well as uh, how much was moved. This is particularly important for this trick that we try to apply in, in sending some flow backwards, so especially uh, to send it back. Okay, and this is what we do in a so-called um, residual network. Very simple idea, but they make our life much easier in applying and implementing this idea of forward focusing. So given a flow network and also a flow, so this is this this flow network will be defined based on network and the current flow. Okay, so given flow network. G, which is we said it has to find based on nodes, edges, capacities, and two dedicated vertices S and T, and a flow F. The residual network. GF. I'm using this notation here, I mean, it's taken from the book here, GF indicating the residual network based on the network G with respect to the current flow F, so this is GF. Which is defined on the same set of vertices, so this doesn't change. You may have a different set of edges, that's why I call this EF. The capacities will change, so I call them CF. But again, S and T remain the same. So the set of edges is sort of uh, 
follows exactly the definition from, from capacity. So the only thing that we really have to define uh, to define a, a residual network are these uh, residual capacities uh, CF. Okay, so where we have for all pairs of vertices UV, we have that the capacity CF of UV is one of the following. So now it depends if we had an edge in our graph, uh, in our original network G, then we simply record sort of the leftover capacity of this. So we take um, the capacity, the original capacity, the original network between UV minus our flow along UV. So this is the case if uh, UV is an edge in our original network. Now comes the crucial difference to the, to the network originally. So we have sort of these potentially reverse edges that allow us to sort of revert and, and sort of undo flow by introducing these revert edges with capacity that equals to, fl to the flow of our current in our current network. So let me, let me write this down first and I can look at an example. So if not UV is in, in E, but if VU is in E, so the reverse edge, then the capacity of UV, so, so keep track of, of U and VU here, is equal to the flow along V to U and N0 otherwise. So if nothing of this applies, we have no capacity. And this defines our set of edges. EF is simply all pairs of vertices that have a positive residual capacity. So this is um, what we call residual capacity. Okay, and then our set of edges is simply defined on the pairs of vertices for which this residual capacity is strictly positive. Only those are, those are really meaningful edges to us. So E of F is equal to all UV elements of all pairs such that the residual capacity along UV is greater than zero. Okay. Any question before I illustrate this on an example? Yeah. E times, ah, oh, you mean um, this here? It's just a set of all pairs of vertices. Do you take a, yeah, all pairs. Any other questions before I show the example? So essentially for every original edge, we keep track of the residual vert of the residual capacity. And for if we have already sent flow along some edge, we keep track of how much it was in the reverse direction. So let me show this in this particular example that we had here. So this was our network. So we're trying to construct now this residual network uh, for this network and the flow show, shown in blue. And remember, this is the flow where we were not able to find sort of a path in from S to T in this original network. And, and we do this by looking at this definition here, right? So we're, we're interested in all edges with positive um, residual capacity in, in this definition here. So when do we have re positive residual capacity? Whenever this sum here, or this sort of this difference here is, is greater than zero, whenever the capacity or when the flow is strictly smaller than the capacity of this edge. Okay, so this is not the case here. We have fully used this edge and it's not the case here. 
So this, these edges will disappear um, because this value here will become zero. Okay, so let's do this. Let's remove these edges. Um, this is this. And uh, this edge, this one here, does it go or does it stay? Any idea based on, on, on this flow? Yeah. It goes back, okay, with, uh, with how much capacity? 10? Um, no. So we have, or any other suggestion, suggestions before I continue? 30? Um, no, but why, why, why 30? How would you say 30? Ah, so the, the flow is given to us. We're not changing the flow at this point. At this point, we're trying to only create this residual network. The flow is, is here. The flow is 20, 20, 20. This is, at this point, we're not changing this. We're trying to construct only this residual network based on the capacities that are defined here by this equation here. Okay. And it says that for every edge in our original network in here, the, the capacity, the residual capacity is defined by the difference between capacity and flow. Okay, so here the difference is zero, so this edge goes. And here the difference is zero, so this edge goes. Here, the difference is 10, so there's 10 left over capacity. And that's why this edge from U to V actually does not go, it stays. But you will have to adjust the capacity to this residual capacity, um, which will be now... Which, which will be 10, right? So we have 10 residual capacity along this edge after sending a flow of 20 along an edge of capacity 30. Okay, so this is what we change in, in the forward direction, but now we have this, these, forward, these, these revert edges. You can, uh, so based on, on this equation or sort of this case. So whenever we have an edge, we introduce sort of the, the reverse edge with the capacity of the flow. So what that means is if I look at uh, this edge originally, this goes from S to U, um, but I have sent a flow of 20, and I want to remember this by introducing a reverse edge from U to S with residual capacity of 20. Okay, and I do the same here. I have a reverse edge with residual capacity uh, 20. Here I have reduced the capacity to 10, and I also have a reverse edge remembering how much I sent here. Uh, which is also 20. So this is, these are our so-called residual capacity. We have a residual capacity of 20 in reverse direction, 20 in reverse direction, and 20 in reverse direction, simply reflecting how much flow we have already sent along this path. And we have updated the residual or the capacity along this edge. We haven't removed it because there was 10 leftover capacity. And this is what we model with this forward edge of residual capacity of 10. Okay, this is, this is our residual network. And these are our so-called residual capacities. Let's see how we call them here. Okay, this one is residual capacity of 20. This is also residual capacity of 10 in this case. Okay, so now this, is this, this was the idea. This is um, our residual network. And if you remember why we introduced this is because we wanted to have this, this more general way of finding augmenting flow in our network using this idea of you know, undoing, undoing a flow. And we, do, we undo flow now by just move, walking sort of on a, on a reverse, on a backward edge. And, and you can see that we can do this now. So before we said there would be, in principle, a path along which we can increase the, the, the value of the flow, but we couldn't walk along those. But now you can see we can do that because we said we walk from S to V, sending 10 units of flow. This is the maximum we can do by, by the capacity. Now we have this reverse edge, the red one, that we can continue walking. So there's no you know, undoing and, and, and reverting. You just walk along this edge uh, with, with capacity 10, and you continue here. Uh, to find sort of a, a, a path from S to T in the residual network 
of capacity 10 that you can now use to, uh, to improve or to increase the value uh, of your flow. So this is what we attempted to do before in this example, but we couldn't in the original network, but in the residual network, we can do uh, uh, just that. Is, uh, are there questions about this example or about residual networks at this point? No, anything clear? Yeah. Sorry? The, 20, the, the red one? So the, the middle one, yeah, so look at this edge here. The edge has originally a capacity of 30, and we have sent flow 20, which leaves 10 units of flow, which is shown by this forward edge. Okay, this is this one. But at the same time, we could also back, go backwards and undo flow of uh, 20 units. And, and undo means that we walk in the backward direction, and this is why we have this direction of capacity 20. This is exactly the value of the flow uh, that we have. And this is given here by this equation, right? So notice that here, capacity of UV, if edge uh, VU in E, so this is sort of flipped. If I have, and originally I had an edge, actually in this case, it's actually UV, and had an edge from UV, so we'll have an edge from V to U with a uh, capacity of, uh, of the flow, and the flow is 20. Goes until 20, I think, right? Yeah. Okay. So then let, let's go through an example, but maybe first write down what we do now. So once we have, yeah. Yeah. Further or here? Sorry? The blue. So here, I mean, originally I just took a path in the original network. Because in the beginning, the residual network is the same as the, the, the original, because flow is zero. So based on a zero flow, the residual looks exactly as the original flow. So if I look at, you know, I look for a flow or for a path from S to T in the residual, sorry, in the residual network, essentially it means I have to find a path in this, in this original network. And I've, I've picked this path. I could have picked another path. I could have picked this path. Um, I could have picked this path but we picked this path. Uh, and, and along this path, I have seen that the minimum capacity along all edges here is 20. So I knew I can sort of push another 20 units of flow along this path. Say again. That would have been 10 initially, yeah. And if you, if you start like this, you can only send 10 units of flow because there's an edge of capacity 10. But so I haven't, I haven't even written down this, but this is sort of the, the, the idea. And so let's, let's uh, maybe first write this down. So what I described now is what we want to find is a so-called um, augmenting path, which is a path in the residual network. So uh, what we need to do in this step is find and so-called augmenting path, which is simply a path in GF, meaning the residual network, given flow F from S to T. Okay, and, and what we have done sort of intuitively in the example before, and which is really the only possible way to do it, is that we have looked for the edge with minimum capacity along this path, because this sort of restricts us to how much uh, flow we can uh, send on this path. And this is exactly sort of the general principle. So we have uh, uh, the following note. Can move this much mass Japan to 
minimum residual capacity. This on all uh, edges. Okay, this makes sense. And uh, Denote this by CF of P, which is the residual capacity of the path. Yeah. What is the one? Uh, min. Yeah, it's the minimum uh, residual capacity on all its edges. But I'm, I'm writing this down actually formally. So CF of P is simply the minimum over all. The f of uv with uv being on, on the path p. Okay, so this is this is pretty intuitive. Um, and this I mean, this, this capacity or this, this edge of minimum capacity along our path denotes sort of the bottleneck. This is really uh, what defines by how much we can increase the flow along, along this path. Intuitively, this makes sense. We did this before, and this is basically stating exactly, exactly this. Now, after doing this, what you would have to show now, which we won't do, is that what you get once you're doing this is actually, again, a feasible flow in the sense that it satisfies all capacity constraints and the flow conservation with an increased value, namely by the uh, residual capacity of this path. Um, the fact that you're sort of satisfying capacities is very easy to see because that's how you define sort of this residual capacity along this path. And I think this is pretty, pretty clear. Um, to, do, to show that this is still satisfying flow conservation, again, the idea is that you're doing everything along a path, but now you have to be a bit more careful because you have these forward edges and these red uh, backward edges along which you can undo path uh, uh, flow. Uh, so you have to consider different cases, but essentially with this flow idea, you can you can show the exact same thing that you're increasing with the incoming edge as much as you're decreasing basically with the outgoing edges. But we're not gonna. It's pretty technical, but intuitively, it's 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 I think very clear that this is leading to a, a new feasible path in in your network. Instead, I want to at least start uh, an example. So let's see how far I get. Uh, so let's run Ford Falkerson basically through one example, going really through all different steps. I think this will explain it. Or are there any questions before I start with this example? Clear? Good. Or everything unclear? I'm not sure. Good. So here's the network. I'm not sure if you've had this before. Here's our node S, and we have a node here, and here. Think. This looks good. So next we need uh, capacities. It should be 16 here and nine, 15, four. Yeah, good question. Twelve, twenty. Is seven okay. uh, one is missing. This is thirteen. Okay, so this is our network. This is where we start. Our network G. And so we want to find a maximum flow in this network from, from S to T using the scheme that we have just described. 
you know, sort of using also these residual networks to help us finding these uh, augmenting, augmenting paths. All right, before I change this, I think I copy this. I'm gonna draw the same thing multiple times. So originally, as we said before, we start from a zero flow. We don't assign any flow. We assign zero to all edges, uh, which means simply that the value of this flow also will be uh, zero. Okay, but clearly, as we said, it's it's feasible. And the residual network of that network, given the zero flow, uh, is the same as the original network. Nothing has changed. And so now we want to look for a ST path. We want to look for an, a path from ST with spare capacity. And we could walk, for example, along this path here. Okay, so this is one such path from S to T. And you can see that I'm only using edges in, in, the, in the correct orientation. Um, the residual capacity of this of this path C F of P in this particular case is four because four is the minimum capacity of any edge along along this path, and this tells us how much more flow we could send from S to T along along this path. And this is exactly what we do: we take four units and we ship this four units uh, along this path in our original network that I'm indicating no, not here in blue, I think we said. So flow is in blue. This is four, four, and four. Okay, so this is our new flow, which has value equal four in the second iteration. So we have increased the value of our flow. And as you can see, it still is a feasible flow. Uh, capacity constraints are satisfied and flow conservation uh, too. So now we continue, we have a new flow and for a new flow, we have to compute a new uh, residual network, which will look like this. This is again. So now the new residual network will change, as we said before, only along this path. This is the path that we have changed. And we have to do two things. Uh, according to the definition of these capacities in our residual network, we have to reduce our residual capacities by the amount of the flow that we have already sent. And we have to introduce these reverse edges that will tell us by how much we can undo this flow in the reverse direction. So, do this. It will be 13. Minus the four is nine here, uh, residual capacity. We set capacities in black, so it is nine. Um, we have residual capacity of 10 along this edge. And we subtract four, which means that this edge is gone entirely. So this edge will be no longer in our residual network because we have completely used up the capacity of this edge. But at the same time, we also said we have to introduce these reverse edges with residual capacity equal to the flow that we have sent in the reverse direction, which is equal to four in this direction and here and also along this direction. Okay. So this is our new residual network based on our uh, flow shown here in blue. Let me copy this again before I have to redraw everything. And now we have to do the same thing. We have to find an augmenting path in this new residual network from S to T. And we could, for example, walk along this path. Okay. And the residual capacity of this path would be seven. This is the minimum residual capacity along this path. CF T equal to seven.
Now we're using this to again increase the value of our flow by pushing an additional seven units of flow along this path in the original network. Okay, so we're, re we're increasing uh, along this edges here shown in green, the flow of, uh, of a value of four, uh, which means instead of four, no, in, of, by seven, sorry, increase it by seven. So instead of four, we will now have flow of 11 units here. So here will be 11, yeah, sorry. This is 11, this is not working now. We had four before and we increased it by seven. So we will also have 11 here. We had nothing here before and now we're increasing it by seven. So we will have a flow of seven here. No, this is not working. And the same here, we will have a flow of value seven on this edge. Uh, value seven. Okay, so this is our new flow. And the value of this flow, oh, I wrote four, uh, zero here before. Did no one see that or didn't want to tell me that I made a mistake here? This should be, of course, in the second iteration, we didn't have a flow of value zero, but we increased the flow value to four before. And now after adding this flow, we have a flow of value 11. So this is what's, what's sort of exiting our source node. Again, as you can see, even after two iterations, uh, hopefully all capacity constraints are satisfied and flow conservation uh, is all satisfied. It's, it's essentially just two paths that divert only in this one edge. And you can see that 11 is coming in and seven plus four are going out. So this is again, satisfying all flow conservations. Okay. So this gives us two minutes um, for, yeah, let's do another round of uh, residual network. So we have computed, uh, we have augmented our path, and now we have to compute a new residual network based on this new increased um, flow. So let me start from here. This was our previous network, and now we have an additional seven units along this previous green path. So I have to, again, update the residual capacities of this. So instead of nine, now, we will only have two, two units left. Okay. Uh, I walked along here. I should have only three units left here. Instead of 10, we have uh, three along here. Here again, nothing's left. We used up all seven units of, uh, of capacity. So we can completely remove this edge from our residual network. And we have, instead of uh, 20, we have to subtract seven. Uh, and get 13 here as a new capacity. Let's finish sort of this residual network and stop here. So the only missing edge here in this case uh, are the reverse edges that carry sort of the flow that we could possibly undo. And this is, you know, having values equal to the flow that we have sent along this path previously, which is seven here, which is seven here. We have already this reverse edge of, uh, of, of uh, four units. So we will, we will increase this by a value of uh, seven to obtain um, an edge, that's not good, of uh, capacity 11. And similarly, here we have four plus seven, meaning 11 units that we can undo on along this edge. Okay, this is our new residual graph. And then we have one more iteration of finding sort of this augmenting path and using this augmenting path to increase the, uh, the flow in our network. But we'll continue with this then next time. Are there any questions? If not, I'll see you after spring break. Yeah.